be at length. But once a air and a highway, a storm bow and a provident ally, a road for the friend, a hunting ground for the enemy. In two world wars, shipping sustaining Western Europe was the prey of a hunter who, hidden by the waves, could strike warning and quickly escape. Though fundamentally a surfaced, the roving submarine used its ability to submerge to terrible effect. The battle against the U-boats became a battle for existence. Today, the submarine layers of Brest and Lorient no longer echo to Nazi diesels. The Atlantic is once more a highway, an ally, a friend. Today, too, the ocean is less a barrier. Over its wastes, flights around the clock. Yet the tonnage of seaborne, instead of diminishing, grows stead pace. Only ships can carry the huge cargoes of the Atlantic's prosper national trade. More ships, faster ships, linking New York with Rotterdam, Montreal with Lisbon, Oslo with New Orleans. The Atlantic, more than ever, the main street of the Western world. At one corner of Main Street is the great base of Norfolk, Virginia. Here, around Chesapeake Bay, colonial America knew its first roots. Here, aptly, the New World safeguards its present-day links with the Earth. For in addition to defending the American continent, Norfolk today shoulders a greater responsibility. For within its limits is the head of NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic. In the great map room of Sant, as it is called, you meet not only with the expected Americans, but also with naval officers, British, French, Canadian, Norwegian, Danish, Dutch, and Portuguese. For should war come, this would be police headquarters of the entire North Atlantic Ocean. By agreement, the office of Supreme Commander is filled by the American Air, who is C&C of the United States Atlantic Fleet. But his business is concerned with many others than just those of his own native land. His NATO command extends to the Azores, the Straits of Gibraltar, the rugged coasts of Portugal. France, at bases of Brest and Cherbourg. It covers the vital western approach to the British Isles. It reaches out to that very north that is the farthest tip of Norway. Then the Denmark Strait and the seas around Iceland, Greenland and Labrador. Westernmost edge, the whole seaboard of Canada and the United States. And between these limits, over millions of square miles of room restless. Today, the Supreme Commander's hiding concern is with the very real threat to the Atlantic since by enemy submarines. The sub of the 1960s is a true underwater animal, staying submerged if need be for weeks. It is capable of shooting missiles into land and then of dissipating the proverbial needle into the haystack. And of this proverb, the haystack, no mean dimension. Almost among the Supreme Commander's weapons against a possible threat of over 500 mile subs would be the force of his own United States Atlantic. Giant carriers, such as the Independence and the Forestal, are evidence of its formidable striking power. Making them a huge potential. Great bases like Oceana, Virginia, there, naval air traffic is such that controllers must be ever toes, coping with landings and takeoffs by the hundreds each hour. A thousand miles to the north, Halifax, Nova Scotia. This is the main base for fleet killer craft of the Royal Canadian Navy. Their task to protect the vital St. Lawrence, Newfoundland, and all Atlantic approaches to Canada. Off the Grand Banks, the Bonaventure carries out anti-sub exercises. With such modern ships, the Royal Canadian would, in case of emergency, provide Sackland with a northern force of efficiency. Greenwood, Nova Scotia. Here, Royal Canadian Air Force crews are briefed for an anti-sub exercise that may keep them in the air for a day followed by a night, and perhaps most of the following day. 
For theirs is the Argus, a Canadian-built military version of the Britannia, a monster that can fly to Scotland and back and still have 500 miles worth of fuel left in its tanks. Another bird capable of almost perpetual flight, the United States Navy's W-2V Constellation, humped with radar and detector gear for air-sea search. Smaller, but no less efficient, the Neptune, flown today not only by the US Navy, but also by French, Dutch, and NATO airmen. For many schools of thought, prove the smaller aircraft theory. For one thing, it can mean more of them. Then, especially endearing to the coastal command pilots who have proved its worth, the RAF's Shem, bearing here a renowned squadron number. The essence of air anti-sub work is coordination, indeed integration, with the naval forces bent upon the same errand. At Joint Royal Navy Coastal Command Headquarters, sailor and airmen are always together. A lone Shackleton flies out from the coasts of Britain on its long vigil. These are men who have come to know the sea almost as well as any sailor, though in their work they never touch its surface. By radar, sonar and other devices, they sweep the waves and the waters beneath the waves. And what they learn, they pass on for sailor and airman to elucidate and take action. Around the clock from east to west, wings over the ocean. Find, fix, and strike. The theories and tactics of anti-sub warfare are being explained, discussed, and wrangled over. Toys on the floor, carriers, planes, whirlybirds, and sonar boys. Here are demonstrated the whys and wherefores of that motive method of anti-sub technique, the compact unity known as a hunter-killer group. A hunter-killer group, a unity of the whole works. With this array facing him, heaven help the lone sub. Command the carrier, her air sweeping the ocean. With her attendant destroyers and other craft, she may command another type of carrier, one built especially to house and dish only helicopters. For to probe the depths and locate the lurking sub, the helicopter has proved itself invaluable. Dunking its sonar to listen, then winding it in again to try somewhere else, like an expectant fisherman casting for trout. Another deadly applique capabilities an unmanned robot helicopter flown by remote control far into the blue, there to be like missiles spelling destruction to any sub nearby. From the mother carrier, control and contact with a widely varied but closely knit. Contact with the Shackleton tune or other long range aircraft sweeping the seas for a race hundreds of miles from the nerve center of the group. Contact with the helicopters operating with the frigates and destroyers. Only by such coordinate can the waste be gone over with the necessary tooth comb. The efforts of many men, ships and aircraft, all to find maybe just one needle in the vast haystack. But found it can be, and when it is, it is destined for the whole treatment. An air strike, the surface ships, closing in for the kill. With such devices as the Navy's Nimbo, the old method of sowing the seas with depth charges has been revolutionized. With these other devices hurling death for a sub far greater ranges. A device as the United States Navy's RAT, a missile swooping out for huges, eventually to sail down by pep and then to seek out the sub with unfailing electronic accuracy. 
Yes, today the lot of a hostile submarine would be one from comfortable. Yet whatever the war games prove, as to these tactics, all engaged upon them remain sobered by the immensity of the task that faces them. A formidable, terrifying weapon. One modern sub alone can dispense destruction that would make the efforts of all World War II's wolfpacks seem tiny. And we consider not just one, there may be a fleet of over 500 of the most modern. But for the Supreme Commander staff, who must do the worrying, one comforting ace in the hole. Piece of massive retaliation. Skipjack, Nautilus, and George Washington. Powered subs, capable not only of sub-killing themselves, but also of handing out destruction, at least on a par with that of any progressor. Off the shore of the States, a giant overhead crane catches, of all things, a guided missile. The tests, which are perfecting the Polaris, a projectile which, fired from a step, can pinpoint atomic destruction over a range of more than a thousand miles. This is the kind of massive retaliation that in itself is enough to make any B blitzkrieg aggressor think twice. Tick. The highway the friend. But for the ships to continue on their lawful business, peoples of the Atlantic to live in peace, until a world free from fear becomes a reality, Tac Clan 2 must continue. The safeguard. The shield.